Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Coach Landon, back again with another episode of Beyond Tomorrow Recruiting. Today, we're going to talk to Layden Westmoreland, the head women's basketball coach at Central Wyoming College. Coach has got a lot of experience, got a lot of interesting perspectives, so we're going to have him drop some knowledge after we run through this intro. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Coach Landon, back with another interview. We're fortunate enough to have Coach Layden Westmoreland on with us today. We're going to talk basketball. We're going to talk recruiting. But first, Coach, I'm going to go ahead and let you drop a little intro. Tell the people who you are, where you're at, and how you got there. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, Landon. Uh, this has been... Um you know, some time in the works trying to get a good schedule to to jump on here with you, but we finally got it done. Um, like you said, my name is uh, Leighton Westmoreland. I go by Coach West. I am the head women's basketball coach at Central Wyoming College. Um, going into my second season at CWC, 11th season as a uh, women's basketball coach overall. Um, prior to Central Wyoming College, I was an assistant at Hill College, um, helped them to earn their third conference title in four seasons down in Region 5, um, was at McMurray University for a pair of years, uh, leading into Hill College, spent six years at the high school level as a varsity girls head coach at various schools in Texas, and I spent one year on staff with the San Antonio Stars of the WNBA, uh, who are now the Las Vegas Aces. I was actually on staff uh, Kelsey Plum's rookie year and got to work with her. Um, a mix of all those years, I was also a skill development trainer in the private sector with an organization in San Antonio, Texas called Spartan Basketball. So I worked with you know, boys and girls of all ages, elementary, middle school, high school, um, college level players. We worked with a lot of um, pro clientele uh, from overseas would come and work with us. And then we had um, kind of a select group of WNBA and NBA players that we worked with during our time in San Antonio as well. Very nice. Very nice. Tons of experience. I love getting the versatile experience on here. Um just because a lot of people think you guys are just born into college coaching and they don't understand the grind and the work that goes into it. It's kind of like being a player, right? Everybody looks up and says, oh, you know, he or she is just built for basketball. They were put on this earth to just play basketball at a high level, but they don't understand the work that goes in behind the scenes. And I always tell people, we as colleges, well, not college coaches, but we as coaches in general, we put in as much work we're behind the scenes we're grinding we're taking the the small school jobs and we're we're trying to go from high school to college just like players are so I love the fact that you have been through that grind to get where you're at and and you keep working and you keep progressing yeah I mean it's it's uh it's been a journey a lot of great experiences a lot of tough ones um you know been able to dabble in a lot of things trying to figure out what it was in this game that I was mostly passionate about. Um, and ultimately it landed on the X's and O's, the coaching, you know, that's where, where it fell for me and being able to uh, be a part of that year long journey for these kids and, you know, getting them through their seasons day to day. Um, and so that's, that's ultimately where my passion fell as the years went on. And so um, decided that this was, you know, where I wanted to be. I love it. I love it. I know you said that you're from Texas. You're in Wyoming. A little bit of a switch. I mean, you still get to wear your cowboy hats and your boots, but climate-wise, player-wise, you know, environment-wise, community-wise, it's a little bit of a shift. I had a really interesting conversation with a kid yesterday who lives out here in Salt Lake City who has a passion to go and play college basketball, but he keeps saying that he wants to stay close to home. So as a coach at a school that's not in a metropolis, in a major city, um, kind of give your input on on the kids who have that goal and want to go play at the next level, but they have kind of that geographic preference. I 
I personally feel that getting to the next level really tests your passion for the game. I played at Colorado Northwestern and Rangeley after growing up in Denver. And so for me, going to, you know, Colorado Northwestern's this big and the city of Rangeley's this big and coming to that from, from Denver was a shock, but I, I loved the game and I wanted to play and I wanted to compete. So I was willing to go anywhere. What would be your kind of input on, on players that limit their options and don't give a school in Wyoming an opportunity because you, you may not be as close to home versus being open-minded and willing to venture out and, and travel to pursue that dream? Um, well, for, I want to preface by saying that anything I say is strictly my opinion. I don't think anybody is right or wrong for their decisions. Uh, but as a coach, as I deal with these situations and players and I come across things um, and decisions and much of what you're saying, um, you know, it, everybody's going to have a reason and a rhyme for why they want to go far away, stay close to home, big school, small school. Uh, we like to call it a fit. You know, everybody's got a fit. You mm -hmm. know, they're trying to find their fit. And um, so strictly my opinion, you know, um, whether people agree with it or not, you know, that's just, you know, that's what this is for. This is information and you take with it, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, for me, I think it comes down to, um, how bad you want it, you know, um, I do see a lot of times that a kid that will have those preferences immediately in the first conversation. Oh yeah. I'm interested in playing college ball, but I don't want to leave home. A lot of times, you know, I'll look back a year or two later and that kid never signed. You know, and I think at the end of the day, they loved the idea of playing college ball more than they actually loved playing college ball. You know, they they love the idea, but they weren't willing to get out of their comfort zone to go make it happen. And so I think you see some of that um, now a lot of again, a lot of reasons kids want to stay closer to home, maybe um, financial assistance, um, maybe. You know, you see a lot of kids that want to stay close to family because it may just be mom. It may just be dad. And so you have that emotional support being able to stay close to them. Um, so I think a lot of kids do have good reasons for what the fits that they're looking for. But there's plenty of others that end up at home in the fall after their senior year because they were being too picky and they didn't want it as bad as they thought they wanted it because wanting it as bad as they thought means going to New York or going to some tiny town in Wisconsin or going to the deserts of Texas and it's not in their comfort zone it's nothing they're used to and then they really start to think well maybe I don't want to play that bad yeah and so um now for me I think it it also comes down to just breaking those you know breaking down those conversations okay why do, why do you want to stay close to home well, this, this, and this. Well, okay, well, we have that here too, you know? So, and they're like, oh, well, I didn't know that. And so it's a lot of, like you, you know, we kind of uh, talked beforehand um, before we started recording, a, a lot of the kids just, they don't know what they don't know. And so um, that's a big piece of the recruiting is you really have to get to know the kids. You know, if you just shut down a conversation the second they say something like that, oh, I want to stay close to home. Okay, well, bye. You know, you never know what that kid even means by that. You never really know how willing they are to stretch. Okay, well, four hours isn't that far from home. Right. You know, things like that. And, you know, a lot of times in this in the in the fall, you've got the weekends off. You know, you can you can leave it. You can leave in the morning and, and be at your di your mom's dinner table by lunch. You know, it's not really that far from home. And so I think it's just about being able to break down those conversations and get to understand more of why they want to stay close to home and find ways that they can understand that the, the, the comforts they're looking for can be found anywhere. And yeah. so, yeah, I think that's a big piece of it. So I think, like I said, you're going to have kids that have good reasons for staying. Um Everybody comes from different social dynamics, um, different financial situations. Um, so I think a lot of that does drive decision making. But then I think there's a good chunk of kids that 
they they think they want the dream until they sit and figure out what it's going to take and then they realize pretty quick that yeah i don't i don't want it that bad yeah yeah i agree i agree 100 percent. i see it every year i've been in this aau high school stuff for a while and i see kids with tons of talent that go off to college for a year and then i'll connect with them over the summer hey let's get in let's work out Oh, I'm not going back. It wasn't, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. And I'm and on the surface, I'm like, man, you had a ton of talent, but I don't think you found the right fit. And you hit on that word, which I think is is probably one of the most undervalued, under understood terms in the recruiting process. You know, I I know a lot of kids will look at status and oh, this kid was ranked in the top 100. He should be at this level or this kid was all region, he was all state first team, he has these accolades. So in their in their mind, accolades equal status and level of, of competitiveness and where you should be playing at. Um, kind of give your input on, obviously being from Texas, I know that you recruit Texas pretty heavily. Give your input on recruiting you know, rankings and accolades and all oh, this kid is a 5A whatever versus that fit because I, I want a coach to kind of explain that where kids can hear that, you know, you might be a really good player on a team that whether it was coaching or chemistry or maybe you're the senior on a team that's playing a lot of sophomores and juniors on the varsity and you guys don't win a ton. But if a coach says, oh, this player plays the style that I need in my system and it's a fit, that player that comes from that struggling high school team could still potentially play at the next level. So so kind of give your input, because I think a lot of kids think, oh, if I'm not at a big school, if I'm not winning state championships, if we're not going Final Four, coaches aren't going to check for me. So kind of give your input on on recruiting those rankings and accolades and stats versus the fit for your program yeah and I was actually just kind of talking with um, a coaching friend of mine down in Texas that that I used to work with and we were kind of joking about at the high school level Texas is notorious for this and I'm not going to mention any schools so I don't get somebody coming after me (laughs) Uh, but you know kids kids and families are switching schools for championships you know, they're moving districts and moving zones and schools are getting sanctioned because so-and-so's, ch- you know, high school, 15, 16, 17 year old kids are chasing titles because they think that's what's going to help them get recruited, mm-hmm. you know. And so um, at the end of the day, if you can play, you can play. Yeah. And coaches that are out recruiting, um, they can see that, you know, and, and it does take old school recruiting where I think we've had such a blessing in technology where we can just sit in our living room and watch games as opposed to getting out and recruiting. Um, But, you know, you got to go out and watch these kids play to really see, I don't pay attention to rankings at all. Um, And a lot of people think because I've been at the JUCO level is why, you know, I don't pay attention to rankings, but I mean, we can, we can count over the last decade, how many ranked, top players are nowhere to be seen anymore Mm -hmm. one and done in the nba one and done in the wnba um ranked out of high school had a lackluster college career you know again the rankings mean nothing that's that's fluff all tied to money and deals and sponsorships and everything else that's what all of that stuff's tied into and for me i think it's just if, if a kid can play they can play you know i think you know there's obviously something to say about the exposure teams you know you're gonna have you know um you're on the adidas gauntlet circuit you know you're with the nike teams you're gonna have bigger brands to play under that can get you more visibility but i like to say when it comes to to aau you either get exposure or you get exposed Mm -hmm. so you know it doesn't matter if you're in front of those coaches if you're not ready to play at that level and so um, a lot of kids will put themselves in situations that they're not ready for. And it actually hurts the recruiting because somebody's told them you have to play for this team or mm-hmm. you have to play in this or you have to go to this camp. 
and they're just not good enough. Yeah. Um, where they may have just been able to keep playing high school ball and made local connections and ended up at a good JUCO um, or maybe an NAI school and had a tremendous career, you know? And so I think it's, um, you know, anybody can be found at any level as long as they're putting in the right work. Um, you know, it's kind of how, how, kind of how I look at it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I, uh, I, so my little brother, he lives down in, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And he was telling me that the school his son goes to just lost a really good player to Duncanville. And he's just like, he's like, our coach didn't have a rebuttal. Like the kid wanted to go there for reason X, Y, and Z. And the varsity coach at the school he was at was kind of like, okay, well, if that's your reason, you know, we need you. They want you. You know, you're a good player. You're going to you're going to play at the next level regardless. And so the coach was was, you know, he kind of felt some sort of way about losing guys to a team that was already better. And so it's like they say the rich get richer sometime. And and that's pretty prevalent in high school right now with kids transferring and wanting to play with their buddies and they get on the shoe circuit teams, they play a season, they realize how much chemistry they have. And then it's like, well, what if you came over and played with us? So I think it's, it's happening more, but I definitely think good players will be seen, especially with the advances in technology we have with streaming games, social media, you know, being able to pull videos off a huddle and things like that and, and throw little videos together. So um, I'm going to jump we're going to still talk recruiting. We're going to kind of switch. And I had gotten a message from a coach that is putting together an event. And they asked me for players that I know could play at their level. So my first question was, are you looking to start your class of 24 recruiting board? And so he said, I'm open to 24s, 25s, and 26s. And he's at a two-year school. So I was like, wow, that's that's." forecasting out pretty far for a two-year program for you personally as a head coach obviously I know you have assistant coaches that help with things like that but as as a head coach your recruiting timeline how far out do you tend to go and I ask that question for this reason do you as a coach ever worry about okay we're in the 23-24 season if I start talking to a kid who's not going to graduate till 2025, what version am I going to get of that player? Am I am I worried that I might be getting excited for that player in, in 23, 24? And what if they plateau and they come in to the 24, 25 season, the same player? Or do you see a player in 23, 24 and say, sky's the limit. She's going to be amazing this time next year. So I'll go ahead and reach out and start recruiting. So timeline, how far out do you recruit and and do you worry about players plateauing before that freshman year? Um, I strictly work on the upcoming class and that's it. I don't go past. Um, so like this 24 class, I started to recruit in January. Okay. So, you know, the you know, when they hit second semester of their junior years, whenever I start to establish those communications and relationships um everybody's going to have their own preferences and people are going to make comments about oh well it's the grind and you gotta you know if you want the players you're going to work for them i mean i'm a numbers guy and you know people can you know they're going to get one percent of those kids that they're recruiting at the community college level three to four years ahead of time I'm not working with those numbers. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put that in, you know, I'm going to put more effort into the kids that are going into their senior years, have good options, but I know they know that community college is going to be a better route for them. You know, um, we're, we're going to find the kids that are the right fit, you know, going after a freshman or sophomore in high school that still has aspirations to go in D one, um, you know, that's not a kid I'm going to have a conversation with. My conversation is going to be with that kid when their senior year comes around and they see 
through maturity that, you know what, I've grown over these last couple of years and maybe I need to start looking for some other things because that may not be working out. Yeah. You know, um, if a kid's a D1 kid, they are going D1. If yeah. a kid is a D2 kid, they are going D2. Uh, the offers are there. They're going to take it very rarely. Um, are they going to go JUCO if they've got a full D1 ride, if they've got a full D2 ride? And so, um, yeah, I can fight for that kid as a freshman, sophomore. But if they really are that evaluation that I think they are, they're going to get the offers and they're going to take them. And I've spent two years on a kid that I'm not going to get, you know, so that's and again, this is my personal opinion, you know, so I'm going to spend the effort on the kid that is a senior that, you know, yeah, they got some D1, D2 interest, but now we're talking, you know, no offers yet, or they're partial scholarships, or, you know, they've decided kind of what their fit and their preferences are, and those schools are not good for them. You know, that's, you know, I really want to play at this school, this school's offered me, but I'm a point guard, and they still have three point guards on the roster. You know, kids that are making those mature decisions that, well, maybe they need a couple more years to develop. And so um, that's where I'm going to put my, my energy in. You know, I've got, I've got one assistant. She's part-time. You know, we don't have three to four assistants to handle all this workload. You know, I'm fitness center coordinator. I'm also the chair of the DEI committee on campus. You know, it's, it's, we gotta, we gotta pick our battles and how we recruit and where we recruit and when we recruit. And, you know, um, it's, it's just a giant uh, puzzle uh, that we got to put together the right way. Yeah. I had another coach tell me that it's becoming a trend in recruiting that college coaches are recruiting a level up. So they're saying that some of the D2 or NAIA players or even D3 level players could have a better opportunity than going four year and sitting the bench or red shirting. They have a better opportunity to come mm -hmm. in at a JUCO level, develop, be on the court you know, 80% of the game, model reps in practice, be with a first unit, play against some of that better competition, which will help springboard them into a higher level of competition when they're ready for the four-year level. Um, kind of give me your thoughts on on the the thought process or the mentality of, of recruiting a level higher than where your team is playing. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, you, you take many of these community colleges right now, you know, you talk some of the greats in on the women's side, the men's side, whatever, you know, they'll give any D1, D2, D3 a run for their money every night. You know, these this high level basketball. And so you see a you see a D2 kid that may um, you know, be a high level D2 kid, but that coach is like, man, they really need a couple more years to develop instead of sitting behind these guys wasting time, you know, sitting on the bench and, and uh, being a practice player. So they go, you know, they, they go to XYZ community college and get quality reps for two years. And then they come in and they're an all-star, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where I think that um, more schools should be going community college route as opposed to the four-year transfer route. Yeah. I'm not a fan of the transfer portal um and how it's kind of really shaken up recruiting again my opinion um i think it's really highlighted something we've already talked about is fit mm -hmm. you know um the reason the transfer portal is the way it is is because people are chasing a level and they're chasing a status and they get there and they realize that wasn't their right fit whether that's the coach's fault or the player's fault again it's it's either or but I think that's why the transfer portal has blown up the way it has. And I think that if coaches recruited more community college kids, they would get, you know, opportunity for more mature kids on the roster, kids that do have the playing experience. They've already got the academic rigor down um, at the college level and understanding what it takes, um, you know, and you'll see, a, you know, just a lot less of those transfer situations. Um, and it's kind of a, different topic for another day but um you know i think that you know the the community college route is a springboard it's it's an opportunity for kids that are good enough to play at any level to choose to get a couple more years of development 
so they don't have to sit the bench, so they don't, um, so they get a little bit smaller, more personal educational setting, um, you know, to also have an opportunity to transition socially. I think that college is an overwhelming process for a lot of kids nowadays with the size of campuses and everything else. So you get a smaller, more personal setting at a community college compared to immediately going to, you know, um, auditorium with 700 class members in your English 101, you know, so I think that it, it, there's just so many benefits to going to community college that um, we try to, in the recruiting process, get parents and players to understand. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a, I don't have an issue with the transfer portal. I have an issue with the freedom of the transfer portal. I think it's just like anything else. If, if it's kind of abused, then it it has a negative effect. I think restrictions are are missing. I think a limit on how many times a kid can transfer is going to force them to really evaluate is that the right fit. I think limiting the number of transfers a school can bring in. They said Deion Sanders brought in like 20 something kids from the transfer portal. Like he rebuilt that whole team. Everybody who wasn't a Jackson State transfer, he went into the portal and he's pulling guys from Alabama and all these other schools. And he literally just rebuilt the whole program through the portal and through kids transferring that that were with him. So I think if they restrict it, you know, football rosters are bigger. Maybe you can only transfer in five kids, maybe basketball, you only get two. And maybe a kid can only transfer one time from their their initial commitment. But like, I understand the purpose of it. And I think with the COVID year getting ready to run out here soon for some of these kids that started, you know, 2020 or or later or whatever, um, I think it's, I understand, I get it, but I, I definitely think it's a wild, wild west right now. It's a, well, well like you really said, wrong. it's, it's going to, fo- restrictions are going to force coaches and players to evaluate whether things are the right fit and that's the biggest thing that needs to take place is recruiting the recruiting game on both sides of the spectrum players and coaches is so greedy it's so cutthroat and that is why players are unhappy and that's why coaches are unhappy is because people are trying to win recruiting battles as opposed to trying to find the best fit and whether that's a player trying to gain a scholarship over another player or a coach trying to beat another school and recruiting a kid. They're, they're not focusing on that being the best fit for both parties. And that, and I think that putting restrictions on the transfer portal would make people really start to evaluate, okay, is this actually the best decision? Because I only get one transfer now, or I only get that. And so you're making people have to think more critically about what's best for their programs and for their recruiting journeys. True. Very true. Hey, so this is the time that I like to call the fourth quarter. And I just made that up with high school, not even thinking college and halves and things like that. But fourth quarter, it's kind of your open mic. You can drop whatever words of wisdom or or knowledge that you want student athletes, parents of student athletes to hear, anybody who checks out the video. Um, traffic's picking up, we're getting 100 hits on a video now, so so drop some words for some of the players and parents that are gonna see this. Um, something we've been talking about big time with this group uh, going into year two, uh, winning is everything. And a lot of people might hear that and kind of be turned off by it. You know, what do you mean winning is everything? You know, what, you know, there's again, a lot of conversation around that, especially with mental health and players rights. And at the end of the day, um, you know, what's best for the kids, what's best for the coaches. So, but we talk about winning is everything. Um, At the end of the day, basketball is a game with a winner and a loser. That clock is going to go off. Somebody is going to have more points than the other. Like winning is the point of this sport, as any sport, football, soccer. Winning is the point of the sports, point of the competition. And so uh, we talk winning is everything. 
And it's not just what's on the scoreboard, winning the classroom, winning um, your mentality for the day, winning uh, study hall, you know, win everything that you do. Um, so one of the trends that we've really seen in recruiting at every level, I talk to my buddies at the D1 level, D2, winning programs, losing programs, it's not biased. Um, kids are coming into college with very little expectations of winning. They want roster spots. They want jerseys. They want um, to be able to change their social media handles that show they're at that school. And then whenever the coaches try to hold them to an expectation of winning, they don't like that. Well, I just want to be here. Why do I have to want to win? And so, you know, that's a trend we've seen. And I know that when this video comes out, people are going to have something to say. And people, <laughs> trust me, I have, if you've seen my Twitter, I do not mind ruffling feathers. I have no problem saying what I want to say. And people can say whatever they want. It's not going to it's not going to make me lose any sleep at night. I love your Twitter, bro. I love yeah. the stuff you post. I you just know, sit there and scroll and just smile. And I love it. I mean, I mean, it's 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 hitting people's nerves for a reason, you know, um, we, we need winners at this level and whether it's a team going to the national tournament or a team trying to win four games, coaches need winners. They don't need kids that are just trying to be a part of it. Um, trust me, there's so much excitement around signing day. There's so much excitement about the opportunity. The, when you finally make that choice, I'm going to sign with so-and-so it is it's a blessing there's so many amazing things and opportunities that are going to come from that that's just the first step now you got to go win mm -hmm. you got to go win everything win the day win the workout win the study hall win the class win the weight room win you know every win dinner you know win and everything you know and that's what we we were we're uh teaching with this this young group i've got one sophomore uh 14 freshman you know, win, win everything, you know, we, we, that's what we need. That's my words of wisdom for parents. My words of wisdom for players is you got to be winners and it's not just on the scoreboard. Cause I can promise you, if you don't win in every other Avenue of your life at this level, when everybody is the best player, then you're going to struggle to find the wins on the scoreboard. If you can't wake up on time to go to class, you lost. If you can't finish your assignment, you lost. If you can't finish the reps in the weight room because you're up late last night um, instead of getting good rest, you lost. Again, those are loser habits. And so um, you've got to be dedicated if you want to be at this level. You know, winning matters. Winning is everything. Absolutely. Coach Wes, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your words of wisdom. Um, I'll tag you when I make the, you know, I'll create the link and I'll post it on, on Twitter and I'll tag you, but I definitely, I appreciate it, man. I know we connected last year at the Jamboree um, and we've kind of stayed in touch over the last year. So I really enjoyed getting to know you, getting to pick your brain, seeing some of the stuff you post on, on social media. I think your insight and your perspective from a coaching standpoint, a trainer standpoint, that experience that you bring to the table is is super valuable, whether it's women's basketball, men's basketball, high school basketball. And uh, so I do appreciate it. And and I got a couple a couple players that I want you to take a look at. So we're definitely going to be in touch through this school year and this season as as the recruiting gets gets going. Well, I appreciate you having me on. I look forward to it. And um, let's see if I can blow up Twitter again. There we go. So <laughs> Take care, man. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. See you.